so I'll get started. So my name is Celia. I have a background as a, a cancer researcher. I have a PhD in cancer genetics. I worked as a cancer researcher at the Norwegian Raven Hospital for more than 15 years. I've been the last couple of years working as a data scientist. I'm currently working in Amesto Nextbridge as a data scientist. So I would like today to introduce you to uh, a, can, a machine learning library called Carrot, which I think is quite neat. So <clears throat> the library was uh, initially developed by Max Kuhn, who works at Pfizer. He initially developed it out of his own needs to run multiple different algorithms for a given problem. As you may know, you would like to try a, ver a variety of different models to find the model that best fits your data. So currently, uh, Carrot is at version six. Its development started back in 2005. So it's quite old actually. And the first version was published on Crane in 2007. I would consider it as a, a go-to package for supervised machine learning. So there's a large number of machine learning algorithms that are built into R. This, uh, these range from a very popular statistical machine learning algorithms, such as linear discriminant analysis and regression, to algorithms more widely used in computer science, such as support vector machine, classification, regression, random forest, and boosting. Typically, all of these algorithms are built by a ver variety of developers, all coming from different backgrounds. So the interface of each of these algorithms are slightly different. As an example of this, consider this class of different predict prediction algorithms that you can apply. You have everything from the linear discriminant analysis to uh, boosting. And when you want to do your prediction, there's always a slight differences in syntax. So you might use uh, the mass package if you want to do a linear discriminant analysis, uh, the G G B GBM uh, library if you want to do gradient boosting, etc. And whenever you choose another library, there's going to be some small differences in the syntax. So what Carrot does, it actually provides a unified framework, uh, like a front end wrapper, for a lot of different libraries so that the analysis process goes smoothly. So currently there's actually 238 different models built into Carrot. You may have an overview of all these different packages if you use the get model information function. But Carrot is not only a front end wrapper for all these functions, it has additional uh, benefits. It, streamline, it streamlines the process for creating predictive modeling, uh, resampling, dividing test training. Uh, it allows you to parallel process the analysis, etc. So some of the different uh, models that you find in R, it ranges from uh, like a simple linear regression to neural networks. And there's several different libraries that, for instance, allows you to do uh, random forest models. And it can um, serve as a wrapper for other libraries that are quite complicated and complex. So it's not only just if you want to do a linear regression, it has a lot of things that you can call upon. Um, so today, I'm first going to give you an overview over how you can use Carrot for the pre-processing uh, process and future selection, how you can use it to split and um, partition your data, how to run your, the training and test, and how you can compare models and some other neat uh, functions that's provided in Carrot. So when 
you with your pre-processing when you pre-process you clean your data that means that you're trying to get your features into a shape so that you can use it in your prediction normalization one of the things that you might want to do is to turn your variables into dumb weight variables so binary variables an example here would be if you have one column that reports the sex you might use the dummy var function in carrot to actually generate two columns where you are uh, zero if you are male and one if you're i'm sorry you're a zero if you're female and one if you're male the two columns uh, note that not all models prefer these dummy variables for instance if you are using a linear regression model or a tree-based model you would probably not prefer the dummy variables um, another thing that's uh, an issue is that uh, you have variables that are like have, they have zero variance or almost no variance so these near zero variance predictors they might become zero variance when you split the data set and they may have uh, undue influence on the model they may cause the model to crash or the fit to become unstable hence you would like to remove those near zero variance predictors and you can do that with a near zero, near zero variance function and this is a uh, uh, index function. So you go through your data uh, with a near zero variance function. It indexes your data so that you can extract the, the, the variables that are actually with a zero, zero or near zero variance. And uh, so it might look like this. Uh, so these are two added columns here when you run the near zero variance function it's uh, reporting here false so there are no uh, variables here shown that have zero variance but there are one variable the ntb that has near zero variance another problem in uh, that you need to take care of when you're doing the pre-processing is that you would like to remove the variables that, or you might want to remove the variables that are correlated. Of course, if you're doing like a PLS, you would like to keep the correlated variables, but from time to time, you would like to get them out of the data. So you can do that by first running um, correlation, and then you could uh, use the function in, in caret, define correlation, and do that, and you can set the cutoff for how correlated it should be, so this is the absolute va value, so it's e either minus or negative or positively correlated, and you remove it at the threshold you give. And also this function is index-based. Um, another issue might be that you have linear dependencies. So if you use the QR decomposition, or QR factorization of the matrix, you might find the ones oh, okay, sorry, that correlate or have um, uh, linear dependencies. So I tried to show you an example here. For instance, here you might notice that the um, column two or the line two and three sums up to column one. And when you do the function find linear combos, you will notice in order that they is um, up in their flag here and you might again it's index based so you might want to remove them from your data so another important feature is of course normalization of your predictors for instance centering and scaling this is done in two steps um, you first have to estimate the required parameters for each operation and then you have to apply the parameters to the data set so this is done with the function preprocess and predict in caret so here i would like to note that in all cases the preprocess function 
estimates whatever it, it requires from a specific data set, for instance, the train or the training set, and then applies these transformations to any data set without recomputing the values. So it means that you can estimate on the training set and take those and apply them to your test set, for instance. Also, I would like to note that you wouldn't run this on your outcome variable, just uh, predictors. Um, so how does, how can this, how can this look? Um, so this is the function. You uh, here call upon the preprocessing function. You apply to your training sets. So the functions I call upon here is scaling of the data and centering. And it's stored into this preprocess parameter. Uh, another issue that you might find in your data is that you have missing values. For some algorithms, it might be a challenge. For others, it may be impossible to run with, with uh, missing values. So there's several different ways to impute missing values implemented in carrots. Uh, one is KNN impute. It uses the mean of the K closest neighbors. You have medium impute that uses the medium of all samples, and you have bag impute. Uh, I would like you to note that if you use the imputation function, uh, this will automatically trigger uh, the preprocessing to center and scale your data regardless of uh, the method. Like if you haven't called upon the method above here, if you use impute, it will scale and center. Um, another thing you might want to do to your data is to transform your predictors. Like if you want to uh, take uh, transform your data into a smaller subspace, you might do this by calling upon uh, PCA or independent component analysis, uh, box cox, etc. And all this you specify into the method of the preprocessing function. So this was a bit, yeah, and also you can have uh, filtering here into the preprocessing uh, within their zero variance that I mentioned earlier. So how does it look when I want to run this? Here, again, run the preprocessing on the training sets and call upon scale, center, impute, and remove the near zero variance. Um, if I look at the output, it might look like something like this. So this is me looking at the iris dataset. It tells me that it's centered for the variables, ignored one for the preprocessing, used imputation on four, and scaled four. And then after you've done this, you um, apply it to your data. So the preprocessing function finds them, and then you apply to your data using predict. And here I take the fit, apply both to the training set and the test set. So this allows you to use the same parameters that you found on the training set and then apply to the test set. Okay, so I kind of talked about the test and the training set already, but I'll now show you how you can use caret to divide into the test and the training set. So you use this uh, by the indexing functions that you have implemented in caret. Uh, one is uh, create folds and create multiple folds. So this allows you for k fold and multiple k fold validation respectively. So you need to specify the k and the times there. You also can uh, do re uh, create resample if you want to do simple bootstrapping. Uh, you can do uh, create time slices for a rolling forecast. Then you need to know that you should order your variable, um, your input in a chronological order. And you can use the create data partition. So this is typically what you would use if you want to have a uh, cross validation, like a train and a test set. So here uh, again, uh, you generate an index. You call upon the create data partition function. You have your training uh, data here that you transformed in the previous slide. 
And here I mention target. So this is the variable you would like to predict. And what is nice for this create data partition function is that you, it actually allows you to um, have an equal distribution of your target in the training and the test set. And the P specifies the fraction. So this means that 70%, 75% of the data will go into the training set and 25% will be in the um, test set. And the list function here that I set to false, it, uh, there you tell if you want to have the data uh, as a list or a data frame, matrix data frame. Uh, and then you subset the training set with the index and the test set as shown here. Uh, so to the, uh, one of the main functions in carrot, the train function. So this section, I will cover the training and testing functions of Carrot. So Carrot has several functions that streamline the model building and evaluation process. So the train allows you to evaluate by resampling the effect of the model tuning parameters on performance. It chooses the optimal model across these parameters and estimates the, pro, uh, from the performance on the training set. So there's actually three different things that the training function does. If you run the function, it might look like this. So here you have your target, which you would like to predict, uh, your predictors. So here I'm going with the whole data set using the dot. If you just have like a single predictor, you might type it like this. The data set that you would like to run it on, uh, the method you would like to use. So here I use the gradient boosting machine and you have this, which is a bit hairy. Uh, you use it to specify your resampling method. And I will definitely get back to this in a slide or two. So you also want to set the seed so that you ensure that the same resamples are used between the calls, between your train calls. Um, you might also, if you would like, for instance, you can call upon the pre-processing function when you're doing the train function. I personally prefer to have the pre-processing as a previous step where I can have a bit more control of it, but you can do it here as well if you want to. Um, another thing that you might want to do, if you're not satisfied with the default uh, evaluation parameters, so if you're running a a regression, it will use the RMSE, the R-Oscar and the MAE to evaluate, eva evaluate the model. Uh, if you're doing um, uh, a classification, it will use the accuracy and the kappa, or the accuracy. And if you want to, for instance, use the kappa instead, you can specify that here with saying metric equal to kappa. So, when you run it, the training, it might look like this. So I'm calling the train function on target to predict target on my training set. And when I look at the output, it might look like this. So it's a summary of the method I used, the number of samples, the number of predictors, the classes, etc. Again, it's the iris data sets. It also tends, tells me um, what is the accuracy and the kappa like when you want to adjust for the number of uh, samples to avoid false positives and you see that at different uh, depth levels and different three number of trees you have different accuracies so it kind of give you a summary how the model looks like if you look at that and then we're back to the train control that i mentioned earlier so one of the things that you can use the train control to is to specify the type of resampling. Like if you want to do cross validation, you can have the careful cross validation once or repeated. You can do the leave one out cross validation or bootstrapping. And you can specify it into the train function as I did previously, or you can have it as a separate entity as I do here. So here I'll try to walk you through it. I use the train control function 
to define the fit control that I then call upon when I'm doing the train function. I set the method to repeat, uh, repeat a cross-validation. Uh, it's 10-fold uh, cross-validation. I want to save the final prediction for optimizing the parameter tuning. And I would like to repeat it three times. So here I resample the scheme three separate times and it's a tenfold cross validation. Yes. Uh, so sometimes your data might be imbalanced. Like if you have uh, two classes, 90% of your data might fall into one class and 10% might fall into the other class. This, might, this may influence your analysis. So to kind of circumvent this problem, you, have, you can resample your data. Uh, so within the train control, there's uh, several different options for sampling called pair. You may downsample. So you might remove some of the 90% of the data so that it's equal to the 10%, if you know what I mean. Or you can upsample, or you can use, for instance, another library called Rose to generate uh, synthetic data based on your real data. And you can do that by specifying it here in the sampling function within the train control. Um, also, if you're not happy with how your evaluation of the performance is, you might actually uh, compute your own custom performance matrices. Uh, this is specified into the summary function. Here I show um, showcase it with the two class summary. That's actually a, a built-in function here. Um, another thing which is nice with the carrot is that it allows for um, uh, parallel processing, uh, if of course it's possible. And you also specify the parallel processing in train control. So we're still with the train function. Um, it can look quite neat when you specify everything within the train control here. So another thing that you can put into your train function is the tune grid. This allows the users to specify the tuning parameters. So like if you're running um, gradient boosting, something like this, you would like to specify how you tune your model. You can do that within the tune grid. And you use that by having the function expand grid. So here, for instance, this is for the gradient boosting. You set the max nodes per tree. You evaluate different numbers of trees. You hold the learning parameter constant at uh, 0.1. And you say that you should have, for instance, here, a uh, minimum number of observations in the tree's terminal nodes is set to 20 here. However, for instance, if your data set is uh, small, you might want to reduce that number to, like, say, five or something. Uh, so that was the uh, tune grid. And if you apply now the tune grid, so I'm doing the train function, I'm going to do a classification in my training set using gradient boosting. I call upon the train control that I talked about earlier, and I use this uh, tuning parameter grid. And then you get the, the, the fit output, shows you the, the analysis from multiple points that you specified above here. So here you can plot it with three different max tree depths, uh, one, five, and nine, and you can follow how the number of boosting iterations uh, affects the accuracy. And then you can use this to set your, choose your thresholds. So yeah, this is a GG plot of the fit. Yes, so now I talked about the, the, the train function, how you prepare your, like run it on your training set. However, when you've, finalize it, you would like to run it on another set, the prediction set, or you want to predict on test sets. So you want to predict new samples and you do that with the predict function. So you take the fit from your uh, training function, 
apply it to a new data. And the type can either be in the format of probability or raw. So if you use the raw, you will get the prediction. And if you use the probability, you will get the probability. So for instance here, you have the probability for these three categories. So yes. So now we've processed the data, we divided the test and the training, we tested models, or we trained models, we tested them, and now we want to evaluate the performance. You can use, if you're doing a classification, you can do that using the confu confusion matrix. So in the confusion matrix, you prepare, you compare the, your prediction uh, against the true value. And this is done using the confusion matrix function and you compare the prediction to the observed value. It might, the output might look like this. So this is your confusion matrix. And here you see that you correctly classified as class one, 183 of the samples, and you misclassified 13 of your uh, class one as a class two. And opposite, you had 141 of your class two samples that you misclassified as class one. So on the, here you have your reference, your the observed values, and here you have your predictors, or the predicted values. You get to see the accuracy, you have the kappa where you adjust for the sample size, and it also returns um, sensitivity and specificity, etc. So if you, for instance, have a, a binary category, you can uh, compute the um, ROC curve, etc. Uh, another thing that you also want to know is um, what are the drivers of this association like? Uh, what what are the um, the axes that impacts the model the most? And you can assess this using the var import function that's incorporated into carrot. So it's also applied to the fit from the training set. And you might have want to have a look at that. So it might look like this. So you have importance on the x-axis and the different uh, um, explanatory variables here and the degree it imp impacts the model here. So definitely here the variable v11 impacts the most and v54 the least. So this was kind of the standard uh, scheme for test training how everything. There's also a ton of other things implemented in Carrot. Um, there's different plot functions that you can, for instance, visualize uh, the um, confusion matrix that I showed you earlier that I'm not going to touch upon now. There, there's, I, there's most likely a lot of things that I don't even know about the tool myself. But there's some things that are really cool here. So I've now shown you examples for um, algorithms that you might want to run, like the gradient boosting. However, when you're in this um, exploratory phase of your data, you would like to try different algorithms. And there is a way to try out different algorithms at, in one go using Carrot. So if you have like here a uh, rather random <laughs> set of algorithms that you would like to apply, and you then use the carrot list function. So here again, you might recognize the target that you're going to predict on the data set, and you have your uh, train control. And now I call upon all the methods that I listed above. So I'm not only calling upon the GBM or the linear regression, I'm calling on the whole set. And then you can view the results as a whole if you want to look at how, how all the models perform or you can call upon a single of the models to see how it performs. So for instance here I have just wanted to show you how it might look if you call upon the SVM. So it again you see the same, it shows the number of samples, the predictors, 
um, the error rate, uh, the um, R square, the differences between the predicted and the observed, and stuff like this. You also might want to look at the results as a box plot. So here you have the, uh, for a different model, you have the accuracy uh, and the kappa here, and you get them all in one go. So basically it's a few line of code and you're actually able to evaluate multiple different models using this carrot list function, which is quite neat, I think. Another thing that's also implemented in carrot is this stacking of algorithms. So when you want to combine several different predictors from multiple models to see if they make a better prediction, like an ensemble model. So again, you uh, define here, uh, uh, so let me see here, you define, um, you use the carrot stack function, you call upon the models that I um, defined uh, above in the previous slide, and here I use a random forest to ev evaluate it, and I'm going through the accuracy. And here I use the stack control specified above as train control. And you can then see how it looks. So you use the uh, random forest to see how well does these model combine. You might, of course, choose something else than a random forest. You may use like a general linear model, for instance, and you compare the random forest and the GLM, for instance, if to see which one of these combines the data in the best way, or the functions algorithms. So this can be done in another way, for instance. Um, there's another R library called Carrot Ensemble, and uh, Carrot can also function as a wrapper for this, so you can do the ensemble model in a whole other different way. Um, and then you can also have, of course, the accuracy, etc. So last year I listed uh, some of the resources. I'll return to this slide afterwards. I'll just also mention that, of course, uh, Carrot is not the only library you can do, like, not the only li library that functions as a front end wrapper in R. You have uh, MLR, you have uh, Sick Learn It. There's different ones. It's, I tried several of them and I'm happy with several of them as well. So yeah, and this is just, I'll leave it at this slide so that you can have, uh, if you want to have uh, more in-depth knowledge about the carrot, you can choose one of these. I would like to especially recommend this one that goes through a lot of different functions in carrot and gives tutorials for several steps. Okay, then I would like you guys to thank you for listening to me.